Hafide, I'm Tomas Manglonia reporting to you from Saipan on another episode of Pacific Matters. Thanks for joining us. On this episode, we're taking a look back at our Six Feet Apart, Six Feet Under series, where we uncover the grief, anxiety, sadness, and hope amid the pandemic of our lifetime. In our first story, we visit the Guam Memorial Hospital's morgue. The numbers keep climbing, but it's hard to become numb to the lives lost to COVID-19. We were filling up. Uh, We requested the morgue last year. This is the second reefer that came uh, for COVID-19. Over 260 COVID-19 related deaths on Guam and people passing away the same day they find out they're positive. It's a hard but necessary conversation. Where do loved ones lie before burial? Internally, uh, we have 12 a capacity of 12 for GMH and a capacity of 9 for the Office of uh, the Chief Medical Examiner. The container, the morgue container, has 27 capacity. At the Guam Memorial Hospital, red tape with the words COVID-19 written on it marks the doors where the pandemic's fatalities lie. At the start of the outbreak, public health guidelines suggested cremation for those who've passed related to COVID-19. It's now changed dramatically. If there's a death, the, uh, the hospital communicates with the family and makes arrangements with the funeral homes in, in, in decompressing the storage. It is a gentle process which requires more help as the death toll rises. In conjunction with our one morgue attendant, we also have uh, two or three uh, employees with the chief uh, medical examiner's office, which is right above us. So they share, they share duties. Those duties extend beyond the hospital walls now to provide a safe passage to funeral homes. To be efficient, the morgue, uh, as the bodies are ready to be picked up by the funeral homes, and uh, they're, they've been processed and all the paperwork's complete, they, the morgue attendant brings them to the reefer, which then the morgue, uh, sorry, the funeral homes come and pick them up. In our second story, we go to the Ada funeral home where some family members weren't allowed inside during the height of the pandemic. Time of, uh, when the pandemic first happened, it was, it was difficult. Um, you know, uh, our tradition, our culture with funerals, um, it was hard because a lot had to be scaled back. Um, Annette Ada has helped families through the funeral home for the past three decades but nothing could prepare them for COVID-19. Government restrictions meant some loved ones couldn't be by each other's side at the height of the pandemic. It got worse when it went down to 10. And 10 people here on Guam, there's more than 10 in the family. And it, and it, it really got hard for the family. For us, we had to do everything to, to uh, follow the, the protocols of public health. And we did our best, we, and we continue to do our best. It's a far cry from the 80 people that are allowed inside now for both COVID and other deaths, but meals can no longer be shared outside like before. We've handled over, gosh, I'll say over 400 families. Some are repeated families, you know, families who come back, and, and, uh, but we've handled a lot, a lot of families. 400. Yeah, because at right now, just this year alone, we're up to, I think we're at 273. And it's an urgent call to bring them to the funeral home where they can rest easier. Here we would not, you know, we try not to let them stay at the hospital. We know that they're overwhelmed right now. And we have our refrigeration system downstairs. And um, so that, you know, we just, we, we, we do our best to pick them up as soon as we can. And their refrigeration system reached capacity. At the peak of pandemic, families were having to wait three to four weeks, sometimes even a little longer, just to have a funeral. Uh, Now it's still the same, but at least in maybe, what, two, three weeks? After bearing witness to the grief that comes with so many deaths, it takes a toll on the staff, too. You would think I would get used to it by now, but I'm not.
Welcome back to another episode of Pacific Matters. In our third segment of Six Feet Apart, Six Feet Under, we sit down with a priest who saw some of the first COVID-19 death cremations firsthand. The first COVID patient dying, um, the protocol indicated, um, and then again, we ran this through the CDC, public health, the government, <clears throat> that it would be an immediate cremation within the 24 hours of death and it was an unfortunate thing because um, families were not able to grieve or to mourn at that time or to be able to even see or be with their loved one. In deep grief families were locked out of being in communion. Father Mike Chrysostomo was there for one of the first COVID-19 related fatalities brought to a funeral home. There were no family members and so that 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 in itself was just very odd uh, very um, uh, unchristian, if you will, and very just, I, I think, maybe even inhumane at that point. I said, my God, here this, this person is going to be cremated and there's just no family members that are here. WhatsApp video calls were the answers to prayers for some connection that families wanted. I wasn't even able to be in the same room as that individual because it was COVID. And so we, we were literally, I was literally behind the wall where the crem crematory was. Um, was it situated and the body was there, I was behind that wall. So I couldn't even go in that area. Uh, that's how strict it was. Those restrictions were confusing and as time went on, were found to be unnecessary. I remember we even had uh, coffins where you couldn't even open the casket because it was COVID. Now we were having caskets open, but there was a bubble glass that was there. And then you had no bubble glass. And now you can go ahead and have a viewing without any, any uh, protection. Some traditions in our most sacred spaces were altered. There's other things that were stopped um, in practice, like um, the offertory, singing. We weren't allowed to sing in church. You can imagine that. Um, but then we slowly, you know, learned about it and we slowly lifted those restrictions. Nearly two years into the pandemic, perhaps more prayers lifted too. Since COVID, many of our families, um, you know, have accepted it in that sense where what choice do they have? And, and so they, they waited till months go by. Some have waited a year. I, I remember just last year or earlier this year, we buried people who have died last year because they weren't able to get, you know, they weren't able to gather. Families are slowly coming together now. I hope that we will soon get back to that normalcy where we will be able to go back to um, the manini, uh, you know, of, of the elderly or the, the hugging of people, the embracing of others. Um, or even the touching of holy water, you know, to make the sign of the cross, uh, um, things like that, and maybe even more singing in the church, things that make us who we are as human beings, as community, as church, as, as, as tomorrows in our culture. In our fourth segment, we sit down with Savi Diaz, whose father passed away to COVID-19 one year ago. In this segment, she reminds us of what her father told her before he passed, that God and family are essential. There are cherished memories for a lifetime, even with a life taken too soon. What he imparted with us was that the most important thing is to remember uh, what's most important, and that's uh, God and then family. And so, you know, with that being said, he was always around. He was very present in my sister and I's life. Um, he actually passed away the day before my mom and dad's 36th wedding anniversary. Savi Diaz will always feel her dad Roy Anthony Munoz's presence, one filled with immense love. Him and my mom, they started uh, an appraisal company, and from there they did real estate, and they always had their office in the home, and so it was cool just watching them work together, do everything together, and they had a very good relationship with each other, and I think that really set an example for my, sis my marriage and for my sister's marriage, you know, what, what love looks like. A hopeful, persevering love that daily reports can never capture. Her father passed away last November, Guam's 82nd COVID-19 related death. It's a very, it was a very surreal experience um, because, you know, you're just trying to support your loved one from afar, you know, and um, At least 263 other families on Guam are familiar with the gravity of this grief. 
his experience was really tough. You know, he had a lot of moments where he called us and he was struggling, you know, um, not being able to breathe is terrifying. You know, you try and hold your breath for a little bit to imagine, right, just breathing very, very taking small breaths. Virtual rosaries took place of in-person once before her entire family could share the same breath to lay him to rest. It may have been different if I had been able to be by his side, you know, um, so that would have been much, made it much easier, not, it would have been, um, easier to get over, or not get over, but to heal from, and, um, you know, and just knowing how hard it is on, on people not being able to breathe and being scared by themselves, so. I think when I see those numbers, I really just feel for the families as well. That empathy turned into a mission. She launched the Roy Anthony Munya project. In the last hours of his death, and as hard as it was for him to talk, he did say that the doctors and the nurses did a great job. And I, I know he wanted us to know that because it was hard for us knowing that we weren't able to be there. And so, I, I took that as he wants us to move forward and be positive and to not dwell on the hardship that he went through. And, and so that's why we were inspired to do this. It provides communication boards for patients to use to talk with loved ones easier. It's already given voice to people in the States, Guam and Saipan. It's something positive and I want to help, we want to help other patients that are going through the same thing. In our final segment of Six Feet Apart, Six Feet Under, we uncover what it means to heal, recover, and move forward amid the pandemic of our lifetime. Guam Behavioral Health reminds us all that we are not alone. Some describe it as the aftermath of a pandemic we're still in, the mental anguish of isolation, death, and financial stress can be unbearable. Because COVID um, does not discriminate. Every economic level, every background, every ethnicity, we all struggled with COVID the same way. We all had the same worries. Whether you were a government employee, a Jibwick employee or not, um, we all had the same worries worries about our children, our family getting sick, and the unknown of COVID at the time. Those unknowns mounted on the stressors of life before the pandemic hit. You're going to have a harder time because you're already dealing with struggles. And so, uh, close to a year, close to two years later, I call this the aftermath. So I've always stated, you know, Guam Behavioral Health is one of the three agency, healthcare agencies. You have with public health, who was at the forefront of the fight of the pandemic. And you had Guam Memorial Hospital, who of course uh, was seeing uh, and dealing with the sick and the deaths. And then you had Guam Behavioral Health, who was dealing with the anxiety and depression of the entire island. They've literally answered the calls for help. A record number of people called their crisis hotline at one point, over 800 a month. You're going to see a lot of people, um, you know, continue to see their counselors. And, and then some, unfortunately, might need medication. So it's a combination of medication and therapy. Um, but the good thing about it is there is hope and you're not alone. A simple but powerful message that could help someone in need. How the community can bring everyone to a place of healing is to, first of all, be honest in speaking to one another. As we begin to gather 
for the holidays as we begin to gather and talk more and more, whether it's face to face or on Zoom or on calls, just really uh, being honest and truthful to um, to one another, you know, and if anything that COVID taught us is the need to continue to be, uh, to check up on the people you love and care for. She says it is natural to seek and get help. We want the people of Guam to get the help they need. You do not need to struggle by yourself. That's why we exist and that's why we're here to serve. Here's more of our conversation with Teresa Ariola. They definitely need to seek professional services. It looks like um, counseling, a series of counseling sessions. It really just depends on how severe their anxiety or depression um, is, and, and then a series of their treatment plan. Um, how does that look? It's, it's um, we're, we're, we're very blessed to have a lot of federal dollars, the administration. I'm, I feel blessed to be working for a governor who is in the healthcare field. So she understands how important not just physical health is, but mental and behavioral health is. And so we have been getting a lot of support from the administration and so, um, healing you're going to see a lot of people um you know continue to see their counselors and and then some unfortunately might need medication so it's a combination of medication and therapy um but the good thing about it is there is hope and you're not alone and that's one of the things that i've been saying i think last year is people are not alone. The comfort level, if it's any comfort, is that everyone in the world is dealing with COVID and how it scared us so much, scared us so to the point where many people develop some major anxieties. I think really how the community can bring everyone to a place of healing is to first of all be honest in speaking to one another as we begin to gather for the holidays as we begin to gather and talk more and more whether it's face to face or on zoom or on calls just really uh being honest and truthful to um to one another you know and if anything that COVID taught us is the need to continue to be, uh, to check up on the people you love and care for. Um, give them a call, see how they're doing. And just honestly speak about how natural it is if you do need to seek help to get it and that you're not alone. So people who don't have uh, a comfort level of seeing a therapist or seeing, talking to somebody about what they're feeling and their feelings and their emotion, um, especially in our culture, you know, cause we're supposed to be tough and we're supposed to like just deal with it. The comfort level is that we are not alone and this is not unique to us. The whole world was affected by COVID, the whole world. So every country, every community, every neighborhood, every family member was affected. And so uh, this is not an issue of stigma because if that's the case and the world is stigma, is stigmatic because 
we all enjoy, I mean, we all were affected by COVID, right? So uh, just talking to one another, checking up on family and friends, and then casually and very comfortably saying to people that you love, hey, if you're having a hard time sleeping, if you're not eating well, you know, could it be you bring it up? Could it be you're, are you anxious? Could this be, you know, as, as we open up, you know, people are scared still to go out, you know, are you nervous about that? It's okay to call somebody and talk to, and that person you should call first and foremost, if you don't have a private therapist or you don't have um, a, a professional therapist or counselor that you know, and that you can make an appointment, Guam Behavioral Health here is your state mental health and behavioral health um, center. And your first conduit to services would be our crisis hotline. A lot of people access the crisis hotline. We have professional people on the crisis call. Many people, it only took them to talk. They just needed to talk to somebody. Somebody needed to validate that what they're feeling is real. To, to hear somebody say, you're not the only one going through this. Being scared going out is not an uncommon feeling. Being worried that you're gonna catch it and get sick or lose or die is not uncommon. People access the crisis hotline and some people, that's all it took. They just needed to get it off their chest and they felt better and they said, thank you very much for listening. And they felt good because they were reassured that I'm not going crazy. I, this is a normal thing that everybody's feeling. And then some people needed more in-depth services and that's where we can lead them to appointments at, for intake and actually being a um, client of ours and being assigned a counselor and, and getting a treatment plan because perhaps they just, um, they have a, a deeper or, or more, the acuity of their depression or anxiety is higher. So, you know, and some people will just depends. Some people will just be therapy. Some people will be a combination of therapy and medication. And if that's the case, Guam Behavioral Health is very uh, capable in, in determining that. But your, your clinical team, and it is a team working together, will determine what's the best approach for your treatment. And so, um, again, you're not alone. Guam Behavioral Health Crisis Hotline is the, the access point to services. And thank you to everyone who sat down with us for our Six Feet Apart, Six Feet Under series. We can't thank you enough. And we wish all of you well, and we'll see you right here next Monday.